is uh, Tarp from Westchester Medical Center, and I'm chairman of the Project Advisory Committee. I'd like to welcome all of you to our webinar this morning. Uh, we, as you might imagine, deeply engaged in the preparation of the application. Uh, this is a really good time to give everybody an update on who we are, uh, what's, uh, what we need from you, and, uh, and the schedule going forward. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to June. Uh, maybe if you could uh, walk us through kind of where we are and, and what are some of the big items that we need to worry about going forward. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Tony. Just a couple of housekeeping items. Um, please make sure your phone is on mute, although I think we've muted everybody. Um, to remind you that questions and comments can be submitted via the chat line, and we'll obviously put the slides after our meeting today. Um, the first thing that I would like to do is to thank all of you from our team, um, heartfelt thanks for bearing with us and submitting our, the attestation forms we asked of you, the financial information forms and the grant information forms. Um, a lot of information, there's been a lot of emails back and forth and you've all been very cooperative and very patient. We are sincerely appreciative of all we've done to help us out. There are still some items outstanding, but we'll be in touch uh, to make sure that we have everything that we need going forward. Um, so today we want to cover a number of things. Um, we do have a new timeline on the capital restructuring process, so we will be going through that, and then we're going to go very quickly to the application, and uh, then we're going to talk about implementation planning and next steps. So I am going to ask Lamont Pomp from Manat to walk us quickly through the capital restructuring financing program and uh, what the timetable associated with that as revised looks like. So as many of you know, there was an announcement of the availability of capital financing through the capital restructuring finance program. And that RFA was released on November 18th. And it's a significant amount of money the state is making available uh, 1.2 billion over six years for capital projects. And those projects really are capital, therefore the expenditures to plan and design and acquire equipment for construction, for renovation, and the acquisition of equipment, including health information technology. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about that um, as we move forward. What it will not pay for, um, and ineligible items are personnel, supplies, utilities. So the design to fund the bricks and mortars of the various aspects of the um, program. In terms of eligible applicants, um, as the box on the bottom left indicates that their organization is capable of entering into the master grant contract with the DOH. That's the hospital and list of organizations that you see there. They do preferred eligibility criteria. So the, this is a matching grant program, unlike the DISREP, the funds need to be brought to bear as part of the project plan. Plan. Emphasis that these projects are tied to the transformational change that is being envisioned by the DISRA program. So these programs are very much coupled together in both their objectives and what they they hope to accomplish. In terms of projects on the right hand side, the state has identified eight uh, projects that they, they indicate will be um, evaluated favorably. And so these are very common to the types of projects that we have been embarking in the creation of district application. Again, the idea is these are to be complementary programs and projects. The next slide, please. A couple key, the, the three I think that, that left to us is number one, that this is a competitive process. The applications will be submitted and that will be reviewed by the Department of Health. There'll be two components. There'll be a technical proposal that will be 65% of the overall score, and then there'll be a financial component that's 35%. Um, as the notes in the bullet sub indicates, that a third of the points awarded for the financial proposal are dependent upon uh, uh, the amount of matching funds that will be brought to bear. So the notion being if you have more matching funds, the more competitive it will be. It's interesting to note that the state also affords the opportunity for bonus points for the demonstration of financial need. So if you're not able to make up um, success demonstrate matching funds, you can appeal and in a sense um, wash uh, the 15 points that you lose for the match with then 10 additional points by demonstrating financial need. 
The second is that these are grant funds and that these are um, not advanced funds, but it's on a reimbursement basis. So that for those familiar with the HEAL process, very similar, that you're going to submit invoices to DOH and be reimbursed for actual costs. And the fact that this program is not restricted to providers who are participating in PPSs, there is an avenue for that. But if you are participating in a PPS, that you must submit it through the PS that you're participating with. We raised that a number of organizations are participating in multiple PPSs. And in that instance, or in those cases, the statement is for the organization to pick a PPS under which they will shepherd the, uh, the proposal to the Department of Health. So the key points and takeaways of the program. In time, on the next slide, a little bit of a holiday reprieve. On December 2nd, the state announced that it was extending the deadline not to coincide with our deadline from DISRIP on the 22nd and putting it out to February 20th. And that gave us a bit of uh, a breather. Um, and I know many of you on the phone and whom we've talked with had started to view the types of requirements for this program, and they're pretty detailed and intense. Um, in many ways, the state is asking for more information in capital restructuring finance program than they are with the details for the DISRA program due the 22nd. So having an extension, I think, was a relief to a great many people. And as such, what we've done is we've communicated change in dates when we will be processing the proposals. As I mentioned, it'll be up to the PPS to organize, collect proposals from PPS participants. And note indicates here the state has asked us to do a prioritization and set that to the state. So now that we have a deadline of February 20th, we backed up the dates in the table that you see below. Can I tell Lamont that priority will be given to projects that are, are very closely aligned with our DISRIP project uh, applications. So um, the state is asking asking us to evaluate your, your proposals, but rather to rank them in order of priority as they relate to our DISRIP project plan. Great. And we ask on January 12th is that if you intend um, to apply for the capital restructuring finance program, if you could send a note alerting CHI of your intent, that'll give us an opportunity to, and a, uh, resources and understand how much processing we'll need to do. Um, mandatory, I know a number of folks have already been in communication with Peg Ryan, who is organizing this process, and that we ask that if you do intend that you alert us by January 12th. And one of the things we've been doing is uh, working with folks um, to help them understand the requirements and how it dovetails with the PS projects. The next date uh, is January 23rd. And at that time, we're asking for the draft applications from those that intend to apply. We don't need to see the full application, but we want to be able to get a sense and understanding of the scope, scale, and magnitude. Again, help us prepare to process the proposals and get them to the state by February 20th. And the date that um, will, will emerge in the new year is that during the week of the February 9th, we will hold a webinar with the PAC the applications that were received, and then the proposed ranking process. And that ranking process will be done by the executive committee uh, week prior. And we think coming out of the week of the 9th, that'll give us an opportunity to do one final compilation and then get the proposals to the state by the February 20th deadline. Okay. Um, again, before you call Peg Moran with questions, we would ask that you please review the state's uh, website and uh, get familiar with the guidelines that the state has put out. Okay, oh, application status. Well, as you can probably imagine, we are DISRIP center, Central over here. At this point in time, we are working a way to get our application finalized and uploaded into the state system, which is not always easy because sometimes they take the system offline. But we are now sprinting towards the finish line, and this has indeed been a marathon, but now we're, we're almost there. The 22nd is the deadline for project plans. Um, there will be um, an extended deadline for revision of scale and speed pro um, requirements, but I'll talk about that in a, in a few moments. Um, the, by the 24th of December, um, the independent assessor 
is supposed to be posting the applications online. So Christmas, everybody, that will be happening Christmas Eve. I will alert people, though, that the state has been missing deadlines with a fair degree of regularity over the last couple of weeks. Because stressed out as we are over getting all of this done, the state has its own issues in terms of um, getting the tools up and running and in alignment with what they're asking us to put into the application. Uh, so after the, t the 24th posting, assuming things go up, there will be a public comment period, which will at this point close on January 26th. And uh, lest anybody think that we'll be putting our feet up here after the holidays, no, 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 we will not. Our intention and detailed implementation plans are due to the state on March 1st. So January and February will be a very, very busy time around here in terms of putting the details of those together. Uh, for those of you uh, who aren't very familiar with the DISRIP application, you can see from slide 11, there are numerous sections um, and they are all uh, very, very closely proscribed in terms of character counts and word counts uh, in the application. So we're working on each of these sections as we speak. Uh, just in terms of the scoring very quickly, um, you can see from the pie chart here that, that the organizational score will account for 30% of the grade and the project scores. These projects that that we believe and the state believes will in fact building blocks of the transformation that is expected to occur in the healthcare system in the Hudson Valley over the next five years. Um, on the organizational section, you can see the, um, the various sections there, um, pretty self-explanatory. Uh, and Tony will talk a little bit about funds when I'll talk about governance in a moment. Uh, by far, the meat and potatoes of this application are, are is the screen in terms of the actual projects that we have selected, all which are supported in great detail by the community needs assessment that was conducted for all three PSs, and led by Deborah Viola here at CHI, and, and she and her staff and her collaborative, her collaborators and the other PPSs have done a wonderful job of giving this region an in-depth and very thorough community needs assessment. And that's foundational to the project. In terms of the application, um, the final tool, which not, it's not even final yet, but the most recent tool which came out, reorganized things a little bit and created a section where we have to clearly articulate the goals of our DISRIP program in an executive summary. And you see the six goals here, they align very closely with all the things we've been talking about since we began discussing this uh, well over a year ago with our uh, project uh, advisory committee. So central is, to, is this patient-centered integrated delivery system in the Hudson Valley, um, decreasing potentially uh, avoidable hospitalizations and unnecessary emergency room visits, form the delivery of behavioral and physical care and the safety net from a silo system to an integrated model. And that's absolutely key uh, to develop a region-wide technology infrastructure that will permit us to share data and communicate among and between providers. Um, not, you know, these are not less important. Number five, to improve the overall health of Medicaid non-insured populations in the Hudson Valley and to advance the readiness and capacity of our partner network to enter into value-based purchase contracts, value-based contracts with managed care organizations at the end of the period. Okay, so is, those are the goals in a nutshell. I uh, just wanted you to quickly take a look at how we're proposing to govern uh, the DISRA process, and you've been, many of you uh, have seen this before, but in essence, what we have created is what we're calling a collaborative contracting model with all of our partners. Um, every partner will sign a master services agreement with uh, the CRI, which is the management office for the Westchester PPS. Uh, but then each participant, where there is an exchange of roles responsibilities and resources be signing a detailed schedule which will be attached to the master service and services agreement which will detail 
the role and responsibilities of that particular provider relative to the commitments they make to us and we make to them for resources. So those conversations will be happening in the first quarter of 2015, and uh, as did year one begins in April, we'll, we will begin to uh, execute those contracts uh, with our key participants. Um, we do expect at this point that we will be in a position to do that after April 1st, once the valuation and the first tranche of funding is in hand. Now, part of our governance model calls for the creation of regional, if you will, hubs. Uh, and these hubs will be involved in the uh, detail around implementing the projects on a local level. Those are not necessarily counties, but there may be uh, more than one county in a given hub. Um, we recognize that the hub borders are porous and patients will move from one hub to another. But in terms of deploying resources locally, we believe that the hub participants will be in a better position to understand where the hot areas are in their particular region and how you know resources might be deployed and how, quite frankly, incentive payments might flow to providers in those, those hub regions. The executive committee will have a number of subcommittees um, that will um, be responsible for the operationalization. Tony, did you want to say something? No, um, so we will have uh, the executive committee will be uh, is, is currently populated for planning purposes. Um, there will be a nominating committee that's established to um, recommend um, to the executive committee any additional members or changes in membership. We don't expect to see a lot. Um, and then the clinical quality committee will oversee that 70% of program uh, that is responsible for the actual transformation on the ground. Uh, finance and operations committee will oversee the implementation. So that's kind of how we're um, we're conceptualizing it. There's been a lot of discussion about this model at the executive committee level, and I would just invite Tony if he's got additional comments uh, to chime in here. Well, I, I think the the key thing here is that we're looking for this to be a process where we um, govern by. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, suddenly losing my my ability to speak in English. But the we, this is the governance in here is in, not intended to be top down, but completely collaborative. Uh, we're going to be built using a consensus based decision making model, where basically either at the hub level or at the executive committee level, we need to have concurrence of 75 percent of the members in order to be able to reach a decision with the, the proviso that if a decision has to be made and the, and the relevant agent level can't make it, that it'll get kicked up ultimately and the medical center ultimately is, as the fiduciary, will be responsible for making sure that decisions happen. And the goal is to never actually have to do that, but to reach consensus both then at the hub and at the executive committee on the, on the best course of action, whatever the situation may be. So that's the one thing I want to add. Terrific. Thanks, Oni. And uh, if you go to the next slide here. So it is a, um, a, de a depiction, if you will, of how we're conceptualizing where the hubs might be and our approach to the hubs. Um, they're not corp entities. They are regional medical neighborhoods, and they, the hubs will create regional governing boards. Um, this we believe this allows for the understanding that um, healthcare delivery is, is fundamentally local and that conditions on the ground may differ from one area of our service area to another. And this does enable providers at the local level to make some determinations once the global budgets are, are developed as to how some of those resources might be deployed. They will also play a role in incentive payments, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. Um, and I'm going to ask Tony now to, to turn to um, the next slide, slide 16, uh, about the categories of digital payments. Yeah, just uh, a couple of slides on, on the money. Not that anybody, of course, would be interested in that, but just, just to understand, um, we're going to get earn money in the DISR project, and I think everybody understands that this is all performance-based. 
but there are three different types of performance that's going to be measured as we go forward. And what this slide depicts is the change over time in what kind of performance is going to be measured to determine how what proportion of our valuation we receive. Our understanding is, is that years one, two, three, four, and five, the money will be split evenly across the five years. Um, but as you see in year one, 80 percent of the funding will be based on hitting our performance metrics, our process metrics, um, and 20 percent on pay for reporting. Um, as we move into year two, we begin to get into pay for, for pay for performance uh, metrics. And by five, we're overwhelmingly getting paid on pay for on P for P, and a little bit on P for R, but no more process measures. So. We were very focused in the early years on hitting all of those process metrics to make sure that we have adequate funding to uh, support the project through the entire five years. And we will be looking to obviously uh, earn most, if not all, of the pay for, pay for reporting and pay for performance as we go forward. But those are obviously much more dependent on the presence of everybody on this call, all of our partners, CRHI. Uh, and everybody in terms of making sure that we can we can get to those measures. Uh, the uses of the funds, if we could go to the next slide here. Mm -hmm. We've talked about this extensively at the executive committee level. We're we're essentially breaking down the funding, and this is a somewhat complicated slide, so I, I'll spend a couple of minutes on it. Um, look at the the. The top line of this is, as you can see, the funds come in in various uh, ways. Domain one is essentially pay for, is the process measures. Domain two, three, and four, we get some pay for reporting, ultimately some pay for performance. Uh, and then ultimately the fifth box, the high performance spent. If we exceed our metrics, those, who, those, those PPSs who fail to hit their metrics, their money uh, money that they do not earn will not be held for them. It will, in fact, be put into a bonus pool and available to those who exceed their metrics. Uh, certainly, our goal will always be to exceed our metrics, and, and hopefully, over time, we may we will have the opportunity to earn some high, high performance payments. Um, in essence, we then will take the money as we earn it, and put it into two major buckets. One we're calling the Central and Park Service Obligation Funds. These are the funds we need to pay the costs of running the program, not only the central office, CRHI, project management office, but also the funds we need to support our individual partners as they incur expenses uh, to staff up or do other, other pro project elements that we require them to take. Uh, and the cost money, our goal is to always hold the partners, uh, keep the partners whole in terms of their expense structures uh, and all of that will be spelled out in the master agreement that uh, June referred to earlier. Uh, we, our general goal, and I'll say this, is, is that we hope the monies that we believe are relatively straightforward to earn, which are the process payments, ideally will be enough funding to support all of the actual costs of the project over the five-year period so that all of the performance payments that we earn can be distributed as bonus payments. Those bonus payments will go into what's called the community good pool funds. And the community good pool funds, we're looking at it as then having three major uses. Um, and actually, uh, one is straightforward in payments to partners. And again, the incentive payments will be specified as part of the master service agreement, so everybody has an understanding of what they have to do to earn payments. Uh, and then as the PPS, now obviously those can't be paid and thus the PPS as a whole earns them. So we will both basically have, if you think about it in terms of your own individual organizations, we will both have individual goals and team goals. The team goals will, will be what determine the availability of funding for individual goals. Uh, second use is revenue costs. There are specific projects and particularly the, pro the project called the Medical Village Project. We're asking people to undertake significant transformation, which will result in a temporary loss of funding as they shut down beds, for example, uh, and reconfigure their organizations. We will decide a pool of funds to help organizations with that 
that the medical village projects are not the only projects that may be eligible for that. And we will we will lay that out as we go forward as well in the detailed implementation plan. And then finally, something that we hope everybody will recognize is uh, as as a positive is what we're calling the transformation pool. Um, particularly, and this is something we think will happen per, probably at the hub, hub level, as the hubs identify particular healthcare issues in their communities need to be addressed that perhaps are not being addressed fully by the open projects that we're undertaking under DISRIP. We'll side monies on that can be applied for probably essentially on a competitive basis uh, within our organization to say, if only we had $100,000, we could really help the community on this. And it does not need to be consistent with any of the existing projects. It will be things that really address specific health care needs in the communities that we're all serving uh, that have not been adequately addressed by the overall project. And ultimately, all of these monies obviously flow not only to support the CRHI and other central services, but go to PPA to the various partners in the organization. So uh, there may be some questions on this later, but uh, that is in general the funds flow model that we're looking to follow. Um, and there will be much more detail provided as we go through the implementation planning and the contracting process. And we're, I think we'll move on to the next. Okay, thank you, Tony. Now that everybody is crystal clear as to how the money is going to flow, um, we're going to, I'm just going to walk you through the final project plans. Um, and really, I want to point out to you here are a couple of things that have changed as a result of additional guidance we've received from the State Department of Health. And um, so the, the big changes here are we had wanted to do very badly a transitional housing program in Domain 2. Um, the guidance that we got from the state and the clarification around that guidance made it impossible for us to even come close to seeing the metrics by their definition. So we decided we would not be crazy and, and put ourselves at risk on that one. So we have uh, substituted transitional housing with the Health Home at Risk Intervention Program. Um, which is actually a very exciting program because it extends the health home concept to folks who've got all of the um, social economic determinants that you would expect to find in a health home patient, uh, but they may not have multiple chronic conditions. So who have a lot of the same, look the same, seem the same, have the same issues, but do not qualify for health home, these would be the at-risk health home uh, folks that we will serve under that program. On clinical improvement projects, we had to, sadly, um, we had to swap out the perinatal program um, because we had failed to fail the metric, if you will. In other words, for the gap to goal was not sufficient, the state would disallow any programs, specific clinical programs that we wanted to implement in that regard. So we have substituted. Um, uh, parietal and cardiovascular, where the tricks were not only difficult, but the mechanics of what they expected for program implementation, where it was a very, very tough lift. And um, we also decided that that project did not lend itself to early and longer term success as part of our official DISRIP um, med, you know, pro project for measurement, if you will. However, I will say. That is our intent to do the kinds of things that would promote, um, you know, that would promote additional care and, and services for the at risk uh, of low birth weight uh, folks in our communities, and to also deal with uh, cardiovascular health um, in in other ways, such as um, through some of the protocols for patient centered medical home that all of our primary care providers will be required to attain by the end of year three. So a lot of these things that people are feel very passionately about uh, will not be um, indicated for the performance metrics as part of an integrated delivery system and a commitment to population health management. We will be doing stuff around those programs. And as Tony said previously, there will be an opportunity through the transformation pool for communities and regions to focus on, on issues that they feel um, are beneficial for their regions. Um, so those are the project plans. Um, um, 
talk for a moment about the issue of um, scale and speed. 80% um, of the project score within the project plans are related to the number of people that we are attributed to our PPS that will be touched in very particular ways by our programs and the speed of that the speed to which we get to our target 100% of the population over time. Um, I can't tell you much more about this right now because there is going to be additional guidance at this late stage. Yes, it's Thursday and the project the plan is due Monday, but at noon today there is a call with uh, Jason and the DOH folks to give us much more clarification around speed and scale. So we don't really feel comfortable going into any detail about this until we have the guidance. We may be substantially changed from what we understand it to be at this moment in time. Okay. Um, now, one of the things that we just want to point out in terms of speed and scale is that it has been made very clear to us and in, in a communication we received last evening that if we are overly ambitious, and we pull numbers out that would look good on the application but are not meant as met as the projects are deployed. It will affect our evaluation year over year. So our incentive is to um, make reasonable projections that are based on our best um, our estimates of how feasible the these mechs, in fact, are in terms of speed and scale. So we have to try to balance the scale points that we would get with the integrity of the our ability to roll out and implement these projects over over the five year period. So it's not an easy it's not an easy set of assumptions that we have to make. And it's a critical component of the project. So this seesaw thing just shows you what we are grappling with and we will be grappling with over the next couple of days as we make our commitments to the state um, speed and scale. Uh, so let me speak a little bit now about your next slide, please. Uh, cross PPS coordination in the Hudson Valley. Uh, three PPSs in the Hudson Valley are Westchester, Montefiore's led PPS, and Rafua Health Center's PPS. And I have been hearing concerns of PPS uh, network members who are participants more than one PPS. So we have leadership of the three PPSs have met and, and have agreed that uh, we will do as much cross uh, PS coordination as we possibly can both to make it easier for providers to um, participate with all of us. We will attempt to streamline the reporting requirements that we impose on our provider network. And we will all attempt to do things uh, collectively that reflect evidence-based best practices that you consistently deployed across projects in common between the PPSs. And a great example of where cross-PPS collaboration is absolutely imperative is in the, uh, in the domain three um, crisis stabilization project, where we cannot do a regional crisis stabilization program unless all three PPSs are in complete alignment around it, and that we're all um, asking everybody in the region to do the similar things around it. So um, we had as leadership, um, we have created a clinical quality council for region, and that quality council has the initial meeting of the three medical directors of the three PPSs has met, and uh, they have been charged with coming up with a um, an inclusive membership for that group of other medical directors from across the PPSs, and they are making recommendations to the cross PS leadership council, if you will, around implementing the clinical programs on the ground. We're very excited about this. We, we did a fabulous collaboration, as you all know, on the community needs assessment. We had one community needs assessment for our entire region, and that collaboration has really set the foundation, if you will, for more collaboration going forward. So we're very much looking forward to working with our other PPS colleagues. To get, um, even our PPS partners. We didn't, we're not being easy, but easier. So that is the intent of that. 
So, Ed, we submitting our application by hook or by crook on Monday. We have parts of it already uploaded into the state's application tool. We continue to populate that application as the next few days go on. Um, once the application has been submitted, we move immediately into detailed implementation mode. I can't tell you what the requirements for the implementation plan are going to look like yet. We do not have them. Um, we expect to have them shortly after New Year's, and uh, the state is actually hosting a seminar for PPS leads and management and clinical directors in Albany in January. So uh, we'll continue to get additional guidance on that. Uh, implementation plans, as, as we currently understand it, are due on March 1st, and so that the state can begin DISRIP year one um, with funding on April 1st of 2015. Next, we need to convene the executive committee and the, and the project advisory committee. Um, we will have a, an executive committee to review the um, capital prioritization in February, um, and we will continue to keep the project advisory committee informed. And uh, we very much look forward to embarking with all of you on a very busy but very exciting implementation planning process uh, right after New Year's. So. In case you think you've all heard the, the last of us as part of the application process, we will continue to be um, looking to our partners to help us to um, develop a feasible and reasonable implementation plan. And before we go to q and A, I I would just like on behalf of all of us at the Center for Regional Healthcare Innovation, on behalf of leadership at the Medical Center, to extend to each and every one of you our hopes um, and prayers for a healthy and happy 2015 for all and our continued um, deep and sincere appreciation for your partnership and your assistance all of this year. You guys are amazing and we hope to do you all justice uh, in this project plan application and we think that we will. So. That concludes the formal part of our presentation. Um, if Tony, if you have anything else you'd like to add, go right ahead. Just to, just to echo the thanks and uh, and the, you know, I, I will say some the eagerness to get moving on actually getting this uh, yeah. implemented. Uh, the excitement that we feel at the medical center is palpable, and it extends across the organization uh, about the opportunity that this provides for all of us to actually achieve. The goal many of us have been working on for all of our careers, so it's uh, it's a time coming up, and uh, we appreciate all the hard work that's gone in. There is much more to come, but uh, we believe it's going to be worth it. So, with uh, let's go to the Q and A. Yeah. So, here, if you have questions, please type questions in. Uh, here are the instructions with regard to posing questions. No, that's for Virginia. Again, if you can type your questions into the bottom right hand of your screen and send them to Keir Wallace, um, we will then relay them to, to June and Tony to address them. And so we, we do have two questions so far. The first one is how will um, PPS participants be able to obtain copies of the, the dissertation? It posted a line for all to see. Okay. At goal, the, at this point, the state has said uh, the fourth, but they slipped on a lot of deadlines. So if you don't see it up there, you don't. You'll see all the applications at the same time. Um, but that's the intent of the state. That this is completely a, a transparent process. All the applications will be posted, and there is a public comment period on, on them. Yeah, and they, and I would just add that they'll be they'll be posted as PDFs, and I presume they'll be downloadable. Uh, yeah. That actually will be the first time we'll be able to pull the application into a single document as well because yeah. of the nature of how it gets uploaded. It's actually complicated for us to even create a single document. So we will be looking forward to having that PDF uh, to be able to have, in fact, a complete application for purposes. Yep. Our second question is how can individuals um, pursue a point on a committee or how will the committee be constituted? Uh, I think that's the, 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 the right the committees that have been established you saw in the governance chart. 
Um, and we will have a nominating committee that will work with the executive committee to make those more per had people participating in lots of work groups. Um, the executive committee will make the determination as to the implementation uh, composition for implementation of the various committees. Will, as we did before with the work groups, be seeking volunteers, obviously, but we'll be going through a formal process that will come to the executive yes. committee for appointment. Right. We will be having work groups that will be called um, based on the demands of implementing the various projects, and those work groups will, as always, be open to people who are interested and not necessarily appointed. Great. Keen, uh, some elaboration on project implementation, specifically whether or how providers whose programs and services are aligned with specific district projects will have the opportunity to come together to discuss implementation details and funds flow. So. Individual providers will be um, working with us um, on very specific uh, contracts, and uh, there will be conversations around commitments that providers will be willing and able to make that will be memorialized in schedules or attached to a master services agreement. We will be reaching out to our providers uh, during the implementation phase to um, ask their uh, for their input. Uh, so all of the major providers will have an opportunity to speak with us and, and us with them uh, around the details of implementation. But again, since we don't yet know what is going to be asked us specifically to do as part of January, February implementation, it's hard to say what we're going to need. With our collaborative process and our, you know, being totally transparent about how we do this, but clearly we can't do implementation without involving the, the providers that will be most involved. That's our intent. Great. Instance probably for you. Um, the question is, how does the transformation pool funding apply to an institution who may be receiving funding through the Interim Access Assurance Fund? I, I the the transformation pool as we've envisioned it is really more uh, project based as opposed to some of what the IAF monies were for. Um, the I. The IAF money, the those who have been receiving IAF monies, must is you know, and, and these are all going to be have to be individual conversations as as we both understand our, our resources and and the needs of our partners are more likely to come from the revenue loss pool uh, is is I believe where those will uh, those funds to the extent that they're we're going to be seeing or or sort of extending the IAF. Uh, likely to come out of that pool, I would think, than the transformation pool. Uh, but we're, we're, I can't say that we have fully through at this point, and and we'll we'll have to look at some of those individual situations. Great. And this goes to I think a question you addressed earlier, but there was a question about if whether or not there is an, a contact person if an organization is interested and wants to express interest in becoming involved in a specific work group. Is there someone they should contact at this? time? You can uh, go on the uh, CRHI website and send us, a, a communicate with us, or you can um, email me, uh, KeenanJ at WCMC.com. Um, we've actually had a, a number of communications from providers who did not uh, make it onto our um, provider network formal list with the state, and we will be opening up, um, the state has indicated that they will be allowing us to accept new partners, but not for attribution, um, for value, but with whom we can um, work and can include as part of our collaborative learning process, best press workforce, et cetera. Great. And those are questions that we've received at this time. Well, it is indeed the case. Um, we would be delighted to give people back some time because we could certainly use it. And we have a few things to do. Um, so, Tony, if, if you're comfortable, I think that we can close the meeting and uh, look forward to our next meeting, which will be scheduled for February. 
February, and uh, we may do an in-person meeting at that time as well. Yeah, buddy, and uh, wish everybody a happy holiday season. Excellent. Thank you very much. See you next year. Thank you. Bye-bye.